So I can see why they want change. This, again, has been bubbling for years. The agents, the player agents, feel in many ways that they've been marginalized by Tony Clark and Bruce Meyer, and they haven't had enough of a say, and that's been an ongoing tension. Let's bring in our first guest of the day, FT Senior Insider, Ken Rosenthal, joining us right now. Happy start of the real baseball season to you, Ken. Did you enjoy that game one? I did, and only in baseball could we see the first game of the season turn on a broken glove. It was amazing. And I wrote for the Wind Up Today, the Athletics Daily Newsletter, about how this was like a bat call to Jason Stark. It's the kind of thing he loves. And it just cracked me up that here we have this team that spent more than a billion dollars in the offseason. The pivotal play in its first win is because Jake Cronenworth's glove did not function properly. Loved it. Ken, what do you think about the Padres and overreaction city on their lineup? It seemed like they traded away Soto to obviously cut payroll, but also still be competitive in the pitching department and add to the depth there. Obviously, the bullpen let it up late against what looks like maybe the top offense or one of the top few offenses in baseball. But when you look at one through nine for the Padres, do you feel like this is a playoff team? No, and it jumped out to me, Scott, to be perfectly honest. The bottom four, starting with Profar. And, of course, Jackson Merrill, Major League debut, hit three balls, I believe 95 miles an hour or more. So he hit the ball really hard. Can't take his over three and say, oh, my gosh, here we go. He looks like he's going to be a player. But Camposano at catcher, they don't have that bottom of the lineup that you would want. Now, Tommy Pham is sitting out there. If they want to go get him, if they want to spend the money, obviously right now they haven't done that. But he's available. There are other hitters available as well. Not so many as there were maybe even two weeks ago. But, yes, that group looks thin. One of the things stood out to me in this game, guys, and it's something we didn't talk about a lot this offseason when we talked about the Dodgers and the money that they spent. That bullpen doesn't have a lot of big names, but Kelly was really good through the hardest pitch of the night. Brazier, Evan Phillips at the end, and Daniel Hudson back after that crazy knee injury he suffered last July. Three of those guys were free agents. Hudson was a minor league deal. He'll make $2 million in the majors. Brazier signed a two-year deal, Kelly a one-year deal. They improved their bullpen too, and I know it was the Padres. I know it's the first game. We're not going to draw any massive conclusions, but that pen could be a strength. Ken, Ken, you must have been listening when I was talking because that's exactly <laughs> what I said. I don't know. Maybe, I, I, maybe you I'm are sorry, finally I, I came in late. Maybe you are finally turning the corner into you know listening to what I actually say about the games. It's <laughs> congratulations. You read his articles. He'll listen to your. Words. I do read his articles. I read his article <laughs> once. AJ, I'm time. sorry. I was not. I was not online yet when you were talking. I apologize for missing your okay. tremendous insight. I, and, well, I mean, I understand you were sleeping because you went to some concert last night with some, uh, some old, older gentleman singing. So I, I, I'll let it slide this time, okay? I mean. <laughs> AJ, how do you know I didn't watch the game, though? Because I know you can. You, you need your beauty sleep. You definitely watch the game. That is, that is a, a missed shot. That right? is a missed shot, true. I, I agree. Ken, Ken watch the end. Um, all right. So anyways, let's get back to the game now. The, the yes. thing about – it was me. This is how the Dodgers are going to win games. They're going to get their starters through five or six, right, go to that bullpen, and they wear pitchers down. They just literally wear them down, wear them down, wear them down until they find a guy that's weak, and they're like, oh, here's four spot, right? I know the glove is kind of the story, but for me the story is – this is what just a tip. I know it's the first game, but this is how the Dodgers are going to win. They didn't hit any home runs because, according to everybody, they, thought, they were saying this place is a graveyard, like the ball just doesn't go anywhere. Like, Kike hit that ball, and he thought – like, Kike thought he hit a grand slam, and it didn't even get to the warning track. Like, Kike hit it and kind of pimped it, and he's like, oh, shit, that's not that's caught, right? But to me, this is how the Dodgers are going. Yes, they're going to hit home runs, but pitch count, wear guys down. They don't make any mistakes. Mookie Betts look really good at shortstop and steal bases, and then they're so veteran heavy, they just do what they're supposed to do. So this, is to me, was a typical everyday Dodger win. Totally agree, AJ, and that's how I saw it as well. And – What's interesting, that game-winning rally, the four-run rally in the eighth inning, didn't start with Betts and Otani and Freeman. No, it started with Muncie and went through the bottom of the order. We compare that to the Padres' bottom of the order. And then at the end, 
Betson Otani gave you the go ahead, or not the go ahead, the insurance runs. So it shows you the depth of that lineup for sure. In this game, they had 16 base runners. Only went two for four runners in scoring position, but they keep coming at you. This is the Dodgers offense. We've seen it for years. And now with Otani, who had a good game, two hits, stolen base, RBI, it's going to be even that much more formidable. So I'm with you. They're going to get kind of a patchwork look at their starting rotation all season. They're going to have to do some different things. Yamamoto pitching in the majors for the first time probably won't go every fifth day, right? Bueller coming off Tommy John. He's going to need some days. Kershaw, once he comes back, they're going to do some different things to get through with the rotation, but they're such a well-constructed team that they should be able to absorb pretty much anything. And I know, again, it's one game, but all of their strengths were on display in this game. I want to hit a little bit on the Padres because we can kind of transition to what you wrote about Scott Boris and free agency. It's another team that's not really spending on the DH position, and yet J.D. Martinez is out there. Transition it to your article, but also J.D. Martinez will look great on this team once Manny Machado gets back on the field, which they assume he will. Totally agree, Eric. And I should have mentioned J.D. at the top along with Tommy Pham, obviously. J.D. is the best hitter out there. At the same time, the Padres are in this position because they overspent in recent years. And they're in a situation where they have some problems with the debt service rule. They've got to get back in alignment. And this is kind of the result. So they are in a difficult financial spot, at least more difficult than compared to previous years. And that seemingly is precluding them from making another offensive addition. Could they use one? Absolutely, they could use one. And they could probably use another outfielder too. And as much as we all are excited by Jackson Merrill and the spring that he had, it's a guy that doesn't have much time above A ball. And he needs to get his feet under him. He might be fine, but he wasn't a high on base guy in the minors. So there are some concerns there. And if he doesn't succeed, if maybe he has to go back to the minors, something that even Mike Trout did once, then you're looking at another hole in the outfield. So right now, yes, they are short offensively. I don't know that we need to look at one game to know that. We could see that going into this situation. Well, you're right, Ken, but this free agent thing leads us to another thing. I, I know you've read it. You're an athletic guy, and Evan Drellick and some other people have put out all this stuff about the Players Association, and it's because of the free agency. A lot of players are kind of not real happy with the way free agency went. So do you have any any new stuff on the Bruce Meyer, Tony Clark, uh, Marino, the whole deal, and what's happening in the Players Union? Because the owners are sitting back going, man, this is great. They're fighting amongst each other. We can't wait for the next CBA. Well, the next CBA is still three years away, so the union has plenty of time to get their house in order. Clearly, they need to get their house in order that right now there is dissension within the ranks. It's a lot due to what has happened this winter with free agency, but there are some other things over the years, communication issues, all kinds of issues that have bubbled to the surface here. And right now, we're kind of in a holding pattern. We are waiting to see how this kind of all plays out, whether Harry Marino can complete his coup, basically, and essentially become, if not the lead negotiator of the union, maybe even the head of the union, because the way this works, only Tony Clark has the power to fire Bruce Meyer, who is his lead counsel. But if he doesn't fire Bruce Meyer at the player's behest, if that is indeed what they want, then maybe the players go after Tony Clark. And that is one thing that is something to watch here because it might just, well, it might not only be Bruce Meyer that goes, it might very well be, as Evan wrote in his most recent story, that Tony Clark is ousted as well. So this is a developing situation. Harry Marino is 33 years old. He's not necessarily a labor lawyer, a trained labor lawyer, yet he's a leader and he apparently is a charismatic guy and if he succeeds in this quest, he's going to need to put some people around him. And I'm sure there are players wondering right now, is this the guy we really want at the top? Maybe, maybe not. And it's just so interesting that this has happened, guys, right after 
The union toured all 30 camps. Tony Clark, Bruce Meyer, their whole contingent visited every camp. And once that was over, that's when this got going. Is there a clear delineation between who is on whose side? I mean, on the outset, on the outside, I'm looking at it and saying, Harry Moreno is, you know, he has a lot of the minor leaguers. He has a lot of the, you know, up and down guys, guys that are seeing some manipulation in their salaries and stuff. And does Bruce Meyer have more of the, not that they would say they have it, but Bruce Meyer has the Scott Boris and the superstars, which would be essentially the entire executive board. Well, the executive board has changed, Eric. It's no longer as heavy with Scott Boris clients. So that's one thing we should note. With seven, well, how many members are in the union? Whenever a member it is, 780, I think it is, or whatever the number is. Actually, it's a lot, lot more now at the minor leaguers. You're never going to have any great consensus. You're going to have divisions all over the place. So it's kind of hard to categorize who is on which side. But I believe it's fair to say, talking to some Scott Boris clients yesterday, that they generally have supported Bruce Meyer. They have thought that he has done a good job. And if you remember... The executive subcommittee, the last CBA, which was comprised, I believe, five of the eight members were Scott Boras clients. They did not want to approve this CBA. And ultimately, the greater player body wanted it and didn't want to go out and miss time. And that's how it got done. So all of these dynamics are in play. There are certain players that Evan mentioned in his story. Lucas Giolito. Jack Flaherty, they're represented by CAA. They are among the group that is trying to enact change. Ian Happ, he's represented by WME. He is also part of the group trying to enact change. Now, those aren't Boris guys, obviously. I don't know if every Boris guy is on board with keeping Bruce Meyer, but there are factions, no question about it. How it all breaks down, is it a clean breakdown? I would seriously doubt it, but... That's what's going on here. All of these guys, Casey Mize put it well in a story that Evan and Cody Stavenhagen wrote. They're just trying to get to a better place. They want to get to a better place. Now, the one thing I will say, the players did approve this CBA. And after two years, when you start saying the CBA is no good, well, it's on you. You agreed to it. So I can see why they want change. This, again, has been bubbling for years. The agents the player agents feel in many ways that they've been marginalized by Tony Clark and Bruce Meyer, and they haven't had enough of a say, and that's been an ongoing tension. But at the same time, if you don't like the CBA, well, you can negotiate the CBA, you approve the CBA, you might want to get somebody different now, I get that. But again, there's responsibility all around here. All right, Ken, I, I know we're getting deep, deep into this right now, but this, this fascinates me because as a former member of the union and was in negotiations and, and went through, you know, the, the replacement player era and, and a bunch of stuff. Um, how much of this, and I mentioned this the other day, they've brought the minor league union into this too, right? And, and Marino was a big guy in the minor leagues, right? So what I read was there's 72 player representatives, right? 38 big leaguers, 34 minor league representatives. How much of this is the minor league guys saying, look what he did, Marino did for us, and they're not even in the major league, so they're not even, they don't even know a lot of these guys. They've never been to the major leagues. Some of them might not ever make the major leagues. That's not a knock on them. It's just the facts, right? So how much of this has to do with, A, these guys not really knowing what's going on and, and saying, oh, we like Harry Marino. He got us, you know, he got us unionized, and he can help the big leaguers. And then, B, the other big problem that I've had, and I've, and I've said this before, is they're getting rid of the middle class, right? They're getting rid of the veteran guy for $2 million that'll sit on your bench. The, the guy the Dodgers have, right? Jason Hayward, platoon guy. I know he had a great year. Kike Hernandez, right? Austin Barnes. These guys that are veteran guys have been around, been through the playoffs. And this has been a union thing for me. The owners can hold down salaries. Yeah, they'll pay the top guys, but it's the middle guys that get held down because they're like, hey, we can pay a guy 750 grand and see what he's got and reward the organization. So to me, those are the two big things. One, are the minor leaguers driving this? And two, is it because, and I've read this, that the middle class is getting pushed out? First off, AJ, the minor leaguers couldn't do it on their own, in my opinion. They don't have enough votes. They don't have enough juice. Without the major leaguer frustration, you wouldn't have this going on. That's what's driving this. Now, you might have the minor leaguers 
involved and supporting Marino. And one thing that's interesting here is, might it turn out, might it, that by inviting the minor leaguers, the minor leaguers into the union, that Tony Clark and Bruce Meyer ultimately set themselves up for this moment because Harry Marino brought these guys in and he's now got some juice and here we go. So obviously there was a, there were a lot of reasons why the union wanted to bring in the minor leaguers, but it might ultimately hurt this current leadership. Now, as for the middle class, it's a great question. I don't know how you solve this problem though, because basically as teams have advanced their evaluation skills, they have come to realize that they can get certain production from young players that would be close to the equivalent of the production they would get from veterans. Now I would argue that the veterans are veterans or accomplished major leaguers. They've proven it. And they also have intangible qualities that these minor leaguers or young players cannot give you. But that's the trend we've seen. Now, my question is, under what economic system would these middle class players be taken care of so well? In a salary cap system, they might suffer the same way. I just don't know how to solve this problem. And to some degree, and I'm not trying to be harsh here or hard on these guys, to some degree, this is the natural course of events in the game, that those kinds of players routinely get squeezed more so than obviously the stars and the young players. So I don't know the answer. I've said this many times before. There are players who signed late for not great deals, players who are still out there, guys who are legitimate major leaguers and should be under contract playing somewhere. I don't know what system would correct that. I just know that it's wrong what has gone on. Okay. Well, I, listen, I've been around to the camps and I've talked to some of these veterans. We had Kike on here and he explained how he went through it. And I've seen a lot of these veteran guys that either I've played with or I've known for, you know, 10 plus years. And they're all telling the same story. Like there's no jobs out there Agreed. for me. There was no offers out there for me. So something is going on. And I know we don't use the C word. We can use the CBA word. We can use whatever it is, but it was a, definitely a strange off season. And I'll leave it at that. AJ, I'll just say this about the C word and that's collusion. I was early in my career when collusion actually took place, when they had the three cases where the owners were found guilty of collusion, had to pay triple damages, and it was $280 million back in the late 80s that they had to pay the players. There have been cases since that have occurred. I do not believe this is as much collusion as it is groupthink. What I was saying earlier, that teams kind of use the same evaluation tools. They kind of look at players the same way and they undervalue, in my opinion, players such as Ahmed Rosario, Tommy Pham, all these middle-class guys, Adam Duval. We can go right down the line. And is that collusion? Well, maybe it borders on it at times, but collusion is when teams are actively conspiring, talking amongst themselves to hold down salaries. I don't know that that's going on. In my view, what's going on is teams are evaluating players all quite similarly and reaching the same conclusion. That is not technically collusion, but there is a fine line here. And the question is whether that line gets crossed. And when I hear agents tell me and players tell me, I got the same three offers from three different teams on or in a span of like two days. That's weird. I agree. That is weird. And that's why the union instructs the agents every year to take notes on all their conversations. And that's why this flares up this kind of conversation seemingly every off season. Yeah, it's fascinating, Ken. And my thing, I mean, it would take just an epic battle to try and get salary floors on their side, service time, uh, team control. I mean, you can draft a player at age 18 out of high school and basically you control him until he's like 28 in most cases. You have a player for 10 years. That just sounds crazy if you redid the league to be able to have control like that, you know? Well, the union had some ideas going into the last CBA negotiations, bringing down arbitration to two years, bringing down free agency to five years, age-based free agency. None of that got off the ground. And for either side to get dramatic change, both management and the union, the management wants a salary cap, which we know they do, if they really want it, you're going to have to miss time. And if the union really wants some of the things I just mentioned, 
we're going to have to miss time. I'm talking about a lockout or a strike, whatever the situation might be. No one has been willing to miss time. And I'm not suggesting they should. To me, it's all ridiculous. They should be able to figure this out. It's absurd that we have a sport where the labor management relations are as bad as they are. It's a $10 billion industry. Figure it out. And yet, it is what it is. There are, I don't know, 50, 60 years of history here of bad blood, and that is why the sport is in the position it's in, and it's quite unfortunate. And it takes center stage in our sport too, all the time, more so than other sports in my opinion, which is also annoying. Figure it out, I agree. Let's finish on a fun note, okay? So Ken, tomorrow is a huge day in the FT world, and I mean that for foul territory and especially for fair territory. Foul territory is gonna run just like you would in old school television, right from our show, you don't even have to press a button, um, into a live edition of Fair Territory. We will see you twice a week. The normal Monday show is still gonna be out there, but Thursdays you will be live at 12.30. And I've heard rumors that there is a co-host that is going to join you, which we will announce No, I'm tomorrow. not moving, I'm not moving. We'll try, we'll try, we'll see. <laughs> we got 24 hours Actually, to figure it out. We, Scott, we interviewed, I don't know, hundreds of, thousands of people, potential co-hosts. AJ surprisingly did not make the list. Incredibly. <laughs> mm -hmm. It was like the Otani sweeps. Thing. I wasn't willing to move. AJ was out early. And got me a you private jet to, to fly to Arizona, and I said no. <laughs> no, no, no. The co-host is going to be remote. That's the only hint I will give. <laughs> okay, that's fair. And the, the only other part I want to get here before you jump is an idea of, of what we're putting out there because I have heard that of course you will go over anything significant that has happened since the Monday Fair Territory, but also I've heard rumors about Dude and Dork of the Week popping up there on Thursdays, and this being a very heavy fan Q&A session. Scott, you are correct on all counts, and as the leader of our group, of course you're correct on all counts. You know exactly what's going on. So yes, we're going to have Dude and Dork of the Week. On Thursdays now, it's probably a better day for it, honestly. It's kind of later in the week. And we are also going to take probably a greater volume of fan questions than we do on the Monday show. So I'm really looking forward to this. The co-host is someone that people are quite familiar with, someone they are going to welcome and think that's pretty cool. So tune in tomorrow. Dude, I how does Mad Dog have time to do all these shows? That's, <laughs> that's what I want to know. <laughs> all right. I will rule out one person right now. Mad Dog uh, is not the co-host. Yeah. We can do <laughs> a lot AJ of Brian now. Kenny. We can rule out Brian Kenny, too. Neither of those guys. There you go. Okay. Had and AJ guys. doesn't work extra, so we know it's not AJ Brzezinski. He doesn't work any extra or Fridays. Never. <laughs> no, none of these people. Exactly. Well, Ken, we can't wait. So uh, we'll look forward to it, and we'll see you tomorrow for that debut. Wait, hold on. Wait, I just got to ask. Right. No, before he goes, this is serious. How was the show last night? You don't have to say who you saw, but was it – Thumbs up, because we got a lot of people that work here that are big fans of the person you went and saw. Okay. There you go. It's not his first, not his first show. <laughs> yeah. No, it is not. Exactly. My, it was not my first show. It was Springsteen. You could say it. Because did you people... dance in the dark, Ken? Did you dance in the dark? AJ, I dance whenever I damn please. Now, oh, people yeah, need to know. Oh, oh. People need to know, and this is a kind of a running joke among the baseball writers. Most of the baseball writers in my age bracket, and we don't need to get into exactly what that is, are big fans of Bruce Springsteen. For whatever reason, it's just kind of weird that way. Some of the younger writers, but a lot of the younger writers, kind of think we're old and tired and should improve our tastes. Well, okay, but we're all entitled to what we like to see. And I've been seeing this guy since 1979, and it's still pretty good. That's awesome. Right. Good for yeah. you. That's a that's a great way to end after some serious biz handled during that seg. So now I will say, unless are you good? No, no. I just want to know if he covered Eric Church because Eric Church covers Springsteen. So I figured he did not cover Eric Church. No. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and great talking to you. We'll catch you tomorrow. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Hey, everybody. Be sure to like and subscribe for more content. We're back here every weekday, all year long. So do not miss an episode. The videos are coming in all day. Here's another video you might enjoy baseball the way it should be covered.